Okay, great. So um, I'm Sirena Galuga. I am the Director of Operations with the Preparedness and Treatment Equity Coalition. And today we have two of the uh, principal investigators who have recently been awarded the uh, Health Inequity Research Grant. This is our first one ever and it's been extremely successful. It was very competitive and I am very happy to, today to host two of our recipients and have them tell you a little bit about what they do. So which one of you would like to go first? Well, I'll just introduce myself okay. and then uh, uh, Jennifer can introduce herself and then we'll, we'll take off from there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm Stephen Crystal. I am, as, as we were chatting about before, uh, among various hats, a professor of social work at Rutgers and also a health services researcher. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, um, and, 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 and also sort of a, uh, 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 a ref refugee, if you like, from uh, uh, New York City government where I spent 15 years working on human services programs. So uh, tremendous interest in sort of translating what we can find in the research world into uh, programs and uh, uh, metrics and, and improving the way that our systems deliver services for people. So uh, uh, I'll, come, I'll come back a little bit to that, but let's, let's ask um, Jennifer to introduce herself. Hi, yeah, I'm also so thrilled to be here and be partnering with PTEC on this excellent grant. Uh, my name is Jennifer Miles, and currently I'm a postdoctoral associate at the Rutgers School of Social Work, and I've been working closely with Dr. Crystal during my, my postdoc training. Um, I'm also trained in health services research uh, as an addiction health services researcher, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's, there's a big importance on focusing on vulnerable populations, particularly among folks with substance use disorder who are vulnerable and disadvantaged in countless ways. Um, and so, you know, really thinking about how can we incorporate policy and systems into better, bettering the care and, and outcomes for this population. That's excellent. So I would like to know from each of you, what brought you to this stage in your career like why are you interested in studying what you interest that's a you know what you what you're interested in that's a big question but if you can give us a little bit of an idea I think people will be very interested particularly with you both being in the school of social work and of where you got to where you are it's interesting that you know as I was thinking about your question uh, because you know I started out in the department of social services in the New York City uh, department of social services and and uh so many of the things that we do today were formed by that period because we were confronting, I was a bureau head in the Human Resource Administration, uh, Department of Social Services for Family and Adult Services, where we were struggling uh, during those years, uh, 70s, 80s, with uh, 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 seeing in front of us at first hand, you know, the wonderful thing about working at the municipal level is you, 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 you get to see very directly uh, the populations that uh, you are you're you're, you're trying to uh, provide care to. So so we were uh, we were working with the, the the homeless population in the in the era that that just homelessness was just exploding in the city. Housing was getting more expensive, and uh, 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 the homeless mentally ill was one of the uh, one of the populations. And we also um, we also dealt with. Uh, uh, all sorts of other human services, uh, family planning, uh, uh, home care for for elderly people, and so forth. But what we saw, what we would always see, was this synergistic, uh, or as we now say, intersectional impact of the of the the different social advantages on people. So trying to help people with recovery, we're increasingly seeing people who are struggling with substance use, uh, the, the people with severe mental illnesses and all of these disadvantages converging. So really when you try to look at the whole person, uh, they don't just have a substance abuse treatment problem. They don't just have diabetes. They, they don't just have uh, lack of, uh, um, you know, lack of, a, lack of a job. They have all of these things. So you really had to take kind of a whole person approach. And one of the things we learn, which is, is very relevant to the work we do today, 
that when you want to get government agencies and health plans and all these other actors to change something, uh, the first thing is that you have to you have to create some quantitative facts that everybody is confronted with and that become public. So this is the whole idea of sunlight being the best disinfectant for inequities and the idea of starting to take all these mountains of data that are available, turn them into meaningful metrics and try to use the metrics to make these systems accountable for these huge disparities, for these huge gaps in care. And really that, uh, and we've since worked with so many states, uh, with federal agencies mm -hmm. to try to create accountability, to try to create met metrics. So if, if, if the people with HIV aren't getting their meds, if the people with severe mental illness aren't getting their visits, um, if the people with opioid use disorder aren't getting evidence-based treatment, let's create the facts Let's, let's uh, make them publicly available. Let's show what the disparities are and let's try to create a system of measurement driven quality improvement. So, so uh, that requires enormous amount of work with the data because contrary to what some people think, data don't necessarily speak for themselves. You have to, if you want meaningful metrics, for example, for equity, you really need to do the work with these enormous siloed data sources at the population health level. And I think that's what's exciting about the project that we're doing here is it is truly at the population healthcare and the care level and the, the, the data sets that we're getting access to are so granular. They take you right down to the community level, right down to the neighborhood level and really enable us to, uh, to, to see all of the, the, these intersectional, to start seeing what some of these structural factors are that are driving the disparities. And they're just really sort of uh, intertwined together, the, the, the mental health the disparities, the substance abuse treatment disparities, and very basic things like whether people with diabetes get a um, uh, get treatment. So Jennifer, you, you want to sort of comment on the same question? Sure. I mean, I certainly echo a lot of uh, the challenges that you witnessed in your work, Steve. Um, but the way I got started, I guess, is a research assistant uh, working in Philadelphia and gathering data for large clinical trials at community-based outpatient treatment mm -hmm. facilities, as well as the VA hospital uh, that's in Philadelphia. And because I was the person recruiting people, I was seeing the same folks cycling in and out and in and out of these same treatment uh, settings. And so many of them had you know, all other sorts of problems that were making it very difficult to either access or remain in care um, or, you know, have successful recovery once they were back in, the, uh, in, their, in their life. And so, you know, it was really obvious that just going to outpatient for 30, 60 days just wasn't enough to support folks, you know, long term. Um, and so that's really kind of what spurred me to get into the field that I'm in. I went to Brandeis University and focused on, um, as I mentioned, addiction health services research and thinking broadly about systems. Um, in behavioral health, we think about uh, recovery and recovery capital, which is very similar to or probably the same thing really as uh, social determinants of health that we talk about in other uh, areas um, and fields, but basically, you know, what are all of these resources that people need and, and helping people build those resources out so they can be successful long term. And, you know, part of that is getting access to good quality health care, not just for their behavioral health conditions, although certainly that, um, but for all uh, every other health condition they might be dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. And we know just for most folks in general in the US, it is very challenging to navigate our, our very complex healthcare system. You know? And so then you layer in both at the individual level, other vulnerabilities, and then you also layer on top of that structural uh, discrimination and other types of vulnerability that make it just all, all the more challenging for folks uh, to really get good quality care and to live healthy, happy, productive lives. Um, so that's really kind of what's driving my interest in this work is just thinking about systems and how can we better uh, serve people who really need uh, support. 
That sounds really excellent. I think that um, another question that I have and sort of piggybacking on that is um, as we were discussing before we started recording, the two of you are in the Rutgers University School of Social Work, correct? Yes. Yep. So which is, I think, a field that is a black box for a lot of people who will be watching this as well as in the world at large. And so I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how being um, sort of centered in the School of Social Work makes your work similar and different and you know what what qualities that that you are getting in being in school of social work that are different from what you might be getting in say within a school of public health or similar what a wonderful question and it's a question that uh since the pandemic has arrived has arisen and all the other events of the last couple of years that hopefully will continue to try to jar everybody out of sort of, you know, business as usual. What was the norm mm -hmm. pre-pandemic? And as you said in, in, in that great interview I was watching, uh, we don't want to go back to the pre-pandemic norm. The pre-pandemic norm was just, just huge structural inequities in, in healthcare and in everything else. And the weaknesses, uh, the social weaknesses, the weaknesses of, of uh, social, social capital, social resources just get illustrated in a time like this. And then you combine that with the horrible things that have brought uh, 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 racial, um, uh, racial inequities, inequities in policing and so many other things to the top of everybody's mind. Uh, social work is really the discipline that tries to bring all of these things together. So social work has roots in community organizing. Mm -hmm. Social work has roots in, in uh, um, it's an interesting hybrid in a sense of, of uh, kind of social policy, uh, community development and action, and also the role of social workers within the healthcare system, which is absolutely huge. I mean, my, 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 my daughter is one of those hero social workers <laughs> in, uh, in an HIV clinic that we used to bang the pots for for a little while. Uh, and and uh, social workers are everywhere in the healthcare system, in the behavioral health system. These systems couldn't run without them. Uh, and and the, the kind of uh, interesting uh, dialectic between among their among their different roles, which is 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 really fundamental to the ethos of a social work school. So in the last year and a half, our school has been it has been very exciting to see how my colleagues became uh, re-energized mm -hmm. around issues of equity to finally start taking disparities issues seriously to uh, uh, try to build them them into everything that we do. And, and at the same time to take another look at our, you know, sort of day-to-day -day lives in these systems and see how we can become better change agents. And what I really love about PTEC is the idea that we can try to bring data resources to, the, to, to, to the, this issue so that, 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 we, that we have transparency, that we can start trying to hold organizations accountable for the failures to bring healthcare services and obviously in behavioral health, uh, social workers are especially integral, but their role in, in behavioral health is fascinating because uh, in many cases, they're, they're partners with people like peer navigators, people mm -hmm. like uh, uh, they're, 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 they're partners in trying to help uh, people who, who have these Again, these combinations of a problem of, of problems, for example, justice-involved people uh, who are who are discharged. And my, my colleague Amasika Niaku, uh, who who is is uh, very passionate about uh, bringing opioid use disorder treatment to her clinical population, is uh, in 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 Newark. It's uh, predominantly low-income people with a combination of substance use issues and HIV, mm -hmm. and how do you sort of bring services together to uh, to help pop these populations? And 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 when we look and and, and she's moved in the direction of uh, 
uh, trying to increase access to medications for opioid use disorder, which we have this sort of dual system, the historical inner city system with the methadone clinics and then the office-based treatment that got with the buprenorphine that got deployed mostly in white suburban areas. So how do we change that? And what is the impact of access to these treatments on people's, on the outcomes for the whole person, on their cardiometabolic care, on everything that happens to them? So, uh, so your, your question was wonderful because it was a choice that I made when I came to Rutgers, which was going to be my home school and uh, a long time ago. And every year I say to myself, well, that was a wonderful choice because I could have been in sociology or something, but I said, these are the people who are out there engaged in the world trying to change things. How about you, Jennifer? I'll just quickly add to that. I think of social work as sort of being the, you know, the space of what happens after that doctor's visit or what happens after you get the prescription. Yes. leading people to actually using services and coming back. Um, there's so much that happens to, to folks outside of the doctor's office. And so social work really is that lens for thinking about not just what are these other resources, but also prioritizing sort of this social justice element um, and thinking more about vulnerable populations and really prioritizing that uh, as being an important facet of the research that you're doing. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I actually, I have a spouse who works at a psychiatric hospital, so who's in the middle of, you know, the, the, the behavioral health system, as well as working with medical populations. And um, it's really, every single day, the same types of experiences that you're discussing. It's a predominant, predominantly inner city population, but we're, I'm in Rhode Island, so it's, you know, it's a little of everything. And the same kinds of problems. And, you know, uh, you know, the reason I sort of bring this up is that a lot of people don't understand social work as a little bit of everything. And so they're underutilized, they're underrecognized. And I think this is, you know, having the two of you here is a really great opportunity to show people that, you know, as I heard before I went to social work school, it's either the people who take folks' kids away, you know, <laughs> or um, the people who, you know, take, you know, houses away from people. I've heard exactly. It's things. the legacy of mistrust. Yes, and we're exactly. seeing the legacy of mistrust going all the way back to Tuskegee and beyond that is affecting people's health in a very real way. And one of the things that we found in, in getting communities engaged in our research mm -hmm. is that, you know, when, when you get the voices of the people who are affected into this study and you say, and you try to translate that uh, that cultural chasm between the people that think think in terms of data mm -hmm. and the people that that uh, think in terms of communities. So so uh, the the wonderful thing potentially it, it takes more resources obviously, and we and, and we're looking forward to working together with you to find ways to leverage more resources. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start by really knowing the data that you're you're working with in order to get the the larger resources. So. Uh, when you're when you're able to say, here's you know here's this is almost like a map, right. you know where are people getting care that they need? Where are they not? You know what's happening in our community? What are, what are the communities where, uh, where where the gaps are 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 most egregious? And you start so you, you start ultimately by thinking about because we we live in this world of massive amounts of data going by us every day, and we use. It's like they used to say about the brain, which isn't hundred percent true. That, you know, we only use one percent of our brain, uh, but we only use one percent of our data, and mm -hmm. and and we're we're just beginning to figure out how to turn all this massive data into usable usable information. So we've really become uh, passionate about a number of these issues, basic issues like uh, whether antipsychotic treated people get uh, uh, treated, get tested, metabolic testing for the effects of the medications we're prescribing to them. Yes. But, uh, 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 but also, uh, uh, also this issue, looking at things that are most actionable, that we just have 
uh, we've seen the drug overdoses and our work has shown in the last several years, they've been increasing more rapidly in African-American communities than in white communities. So we haven't really reached, you know, reach, we've, we've had 700,000 Americans die since 2000. And increasingly that is now happening in inner city and, and communities of color. And we have effective treatments and these effective treatments are not reaching people. So what are the, what are the many uh, contributing factors to that? That legacy of mistrust is one of them. So you, you, you start trying to look at systematically, what are the barriers? You talk to the patients, you look at the data, you look at the systems and you say, why are we failing? Why do we have uh, uh, half as half as, uh, uh, as 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 great a likelihood of of an African American with opioid use disorder receiving buprenorphine? Why do people come into treatment and then the system doesn't succeed in keeping them into treatment long enough? So, uh, uh, our many of the people in our group are just passionate about this because we see it as something that could be changed. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to change in some places, but where are the bright spots? You know, where, where do we have models? Right. Uh, uh, we, we're, we're gonna try to take a, take a look at Baltimore where Baltimore uh, really with actually some of our research colleagues who were in, in the system at that time, uh, deployed buprenorphine at a massive scale in, in, in opioid treatment programs. So just trying to find out what works and use the data to create a system to uh, understand what the problems are and to try to decipher, uh, uh, get some actionable information on, on these structural causes of inequities. So that, that brings me to your proposed in investigation that we will be working with you on. Um, and you mentioned sort of one of the, the key things for me is bringing the idea of working with data together with the idea of working directly with communities and bridging that gap, which is something that people in a lot of other fields are just now discovering. <laughs> and yep. so if you could tell me a little bit actually as much as you can really, about uh, the project that you propose to do. And you'll be working with one of our data uh, partners, IQVIA, on this project. So if you could just tell us what you proposed to do, the population that you're interested in working with. And I really love that your applic application was so multifactorial factorial and interdisciplinary and very um, descriptive about the different layers that you would be working with to create a more comprehensive investigation of a, you know, a, a health inequity. So if you could just, you know, talk of the two of you talk about um, what right. you're planning to do, how you're going to work with IQVIA and yeah. what your project will look like. Absolutely. So um, this is, you know, as you, as you said, it's, it's uh, uh, one of the things we really loved about uh, the request for proposals is the the uh, uh, the invitation to sort of think intersectionally uh, about the way that different sorts of disparities and structural factors uh, drive uh, drive uh, 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 our, our structural sources for the disparities and uh, and and the approach that we've taken is to really think about. Uh, from sort of a whole person point of view at not just one dimension of um, uh, say specific uh, cardiometabolic measures, although we're going to uh, develop those measures or specific uh, substance use disorders or severe mental illness metrics, but try to look at a more, more holistic way and, uh, and, and, and try to understand this uh, using these huge national data to, to uh, bring in variables from the community level. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jennifer has been very instrumental within our group in helping us to bring together these enormous national databases that can be kind of overwhelming with uh, very specific community characteristics that you can get from linking to, to, uh, to databases at the county level or even at the zip code level with the, the kind of social resources that exist in a community, the demographic makeup of the community um, and try to bring those together. So clearly uh, I think what we 
have to do in this project and we look forward to, to doing with you is to sort of you know balance these very large ambitions with with uh, a step-by-step -step approach that lets us do you know let 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 let's lets us create uh, 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 some 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 real empirical information kind of one step at a time so as as you've sort of I, I guess alluded to this is a very big agenda the wonderful thing about this grant is that enables us to make a good start because to to and 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 we look forward to working together to to uh, uh, approach other folks with with bucks uh, who who support research to 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 help us to take the next steps. So it's part of a developmental trajectory. So we're going to develop some some specific uh, initial products, initial objectives, but at the same time, really uh, aim to use this as a launching pad to do. So when you think about, for example, community engaged research, so then you need to bring in the resources to, uh, to, to, to do the complicated data analysis and the community engagement. So all of this we see as, as, as a continuum. So we, we have some, some specific objectives. At the same time, we're going to be working to uh, to try to you know the, the the grant is providing us with uh, a wonderful opportunity to you have to bring all together all the different pieces and one of the pieces is uh, that you you have to be able to show uh, that you understand the data sources and have demonstrated uh, a facility with the data sources so uh, uh, we think that there's some uh, some of the lower hanging fruit that we can get after right away. And at the same time, uh, we, we plan to, because we have a vision of how we could try to build this step-by-step step and build in other partners. So we're completely about partnership. And, and one, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the really cool things about this project is our partnership with the, the, the group at Indiana University with uh, Dr. Kozali Simon and her colleagues uh, who, uh, can help us sort of take advantage of some of the richness of this data and leverage off of some work that were funded by Pew Trusts to do. Uh, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the Pew work, but it gives us a start. So that is that is looking at disparities uh, in in this case in 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 uh, opioid use disorder treatment. So so we've defined a few specific things, mm -hmm. you know, some of some of these sort of, you know, taking it one step at a time, trying to have some impact with this work early on, but at the same time, kind of being clear minded about what's going to be required to uh, for the for the larger task. Uh, Jennifer, what would you add to that? I think you said it all, Steve. Um, you know, I think the only other thing that I that I really love about the application for PTEC um, is that we are thinking about our community where Rutgers is situated, which is New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about, you know, what kind of quick turnaround products can we create that are New Jersey focused um, that can help spur some of those conversations with community partners as we start thinking about larger, uh, you know, future grants what are some potential policy solutions based on some of the information that we're getting from this work mm -hmm. uh, and helping us think about some of those bright spots uh, analyses that we might want to conduct. That sounds really excellent. I think you're just in line with what we were looking for, which was just people who are trying to solve problems and not just describe them, but actually start using the funding that we um, are providing to investigate solutions. And that's you know exactly what you're doing. And I'm glad that this will be a launching pad for you. Now, I know that you've been in discussion. You've, you've had, have you had discussions with IQVIA beyond our- We, 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 okay. we have, they've been, okay. they've been excellent. And, and uh, uh, because, you know, this is sort of, again, this, 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 this sort of juggling act of balancing the bigger vision mm -hmm. uh, with with getting the mechanics right and being good scientists. So so part of that is every time that you embark on a new data set like this, you're dealing with immense complexities. You know you have to understand where the strengths are, where the limitations are, uh, what are the things to look out out for, 
Um, and uh, the, the partners that, that, that we've been in touch with at IQV have been wonderful in helping us to start the conversation about, because even, even the first stage of figuring out exactly what, you know, what the data cut's gonna be, mm -hmm. what are gonna be included, in, in, involves uh, understanding some things that uh, you, you really have to uh, sort of talk to the data producers, the people that know the data best, and ultimately as we start working with the data, uh, we'll have proof of concept uh, about uh, uh, which aspects to, to proceed with, which are the measures that are going to be most compelling. Uh, there's enormous complexity and, and the, the data resources that IQVIA has are extraordinary and extraordinarily complex and extraordinarily granular. So just, just even in those first steps of, of uh, we've had, we've had a, a couple of terrific meetings and, and uh, Jennifer has been following up um, with, uh, with their, their team uh, to try to define exactly what they're going to be able to provide uh, and, and, and start refining some of our plans. So, so it, it, it's a real partnership. So this whole project is, and already involves so many partnerships, our partnership with Indiana, our partnership with IQVIA, our partnership with, with you and PTEC. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way that you make progress in this area. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, if, this kind of work has been siloed for far too long. And again, right. that's one of the, the, the big goals that I have for uh, PTEC is really bringing together all of these different streams that have been working um, perhaps until rather recently, independently on the same types of problems, using different methods and different approaches and getting them all together and sitting down and saying, how can we solve this problem using the skills that we have? And one, of the, one of the challenges with your project is, is, is you know, making a step towards is, mm -hmm. is just trying to help, help create some proof of concept for yes. the, this whole idea of using data to drive improvements in inequities, uh, uh, re really, you know, sort of reminds us all of the underinvestment in the use of data in mm -hmm. our whole system. So, so health systems, med you know, Medicaid programs, Medicare, whatever, in you know, we in, we spend eighteen percent of our gross domestic product in, on healthcare, but we underinvest in the essential work of making sense of those data. And that's something that, I mean, my, my, my wish for PTEC is that the work that you're doing will attract some of the folks with the deep pockets to really help, uh, uh, help, help, help them uh, partner in, the, in those investments because it's a big undertaking. You know, the, the, one of the reasons that we're, we have this low hanging fruit is that the systems that we work with just don't have the resources themselves or, or necessarily the motivation to, you know, they're solving day-to-day -day problems with paying claims. Right. And, and uh, what we're trying to do is to say, let's have proof of concept about what these kind of data can really, can really do to drive improvement. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about your, let's say your low hanging fruits, your, your more immediate goals with regards to this project, um, what would they be? We're still, so we're still defining them. It's what this okay. process of dialogue and, 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 and we would love to engage you in this dialogue as well as this, uh, uh, you know, as this process unfolds. The, the uh, um, IQVIA, I think, is, is, ha, has been very good about, you know, understanding that this is, this is a process that will take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, to work to bring some, some, you know, analytic resources to it, but this gives us a huge head start. So uh, uh, w one of the things that we are, uh, that we, we see as the, the low hanging fruit is, is, is just some of the disparities that have happened during the COVID period. Okay. Because the wonderful thing about these data resources is that they're close to real time. So uh, uh, people have looked at the, the, the impact of uh, uh, during the COVID period of, of uh, changes in behavioral health, for example, uh, uh, the, the shift towards telehealth, which has been huge in mental health. Uh, and you, know, you, were, you were talking about just the ability to uh, um, have a mental health visit or, or, or uh, uh, 
uh, an addiction treatment visit with without having to leave work or without having to get up at five o'clock in the morning to be at the right. the uh, uh, or four o'clock in the morning to 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 wait in line at the methadone clinic and then be late to work. So uh, and the and the, um, uh, the the different effect of all these changes uh, at the community level. So um, and and. I mentioned, for example, you know, some of the, what are the ways that we can try to reduce the number of overdose deaths in inner city communities where we have to have full access to, to, uh, to, to evidence-based treatments, the same way that we dealt with HIV as, as a, a, a huge national problem that required investment. So that's going to be, that's going to be one of the things that we're going to look at early on. And, and uh, we had started to work on, on some of those things with our Indiana uh, colleagues and uh, the the data that they had available, the pharmacy data, you know, were, were cut off in February of, of uh, 2021. So this is going to give us more recent data oh. to look at some of those questions. We're going to try to start looking at some of the uh, uh, some of the really basic indicators of of uh, uh, things like metabolic testing. Mm -hmm. So often people don't get into the treatment system because we're not doing the screening in the first place. So some of those measures, again, trying to balance the limited resources that we have so far with, with uh, trying to do uh, uh, a limited set of things that we, can, we think we can do in a fairly uh, rigorous and valid, valid way. And at the same time, build proof of concept for the, the more complex analyses that need to be done. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, how, what, what do you think of as some of your goals, you know, immediate goals for this project, being a postdoc and everything? <laughs> um, in my postdoc, I've been really lucky to have found Steve and his group because I'm, I'm learning on the fly how to work with these really complicated and, and huge data sources. So that's really been kind of my driving force in my own training in the last, you know, year and a half or, or two. Um, and so this is an excellent opportunity for me to just continue with that training and, and really expand on that training into thinking more about not only, you know, the claims themselves, but also ways of linking with these community level data mm -hmm. um, that have been out there that exists that people are now finally, you know, thinking more about, but that really, you know, how do we link them? What are the most optimal uh, variables for what we're interested in studying? So um, this gives me a great opportunity to expand on, on that training and, and thinking about data to inform, you know, these important uh, questions that I've been thinking about. And I should mention this, you know, this, this whole voyage of trying to bring together the things that are necessary to change things. You need to bring together the access to the data. You need to bring together creating uh, human capital expertise, mm -hmm. uh, developing the careers of the next generation of br brilliant scholars like Jennifer, uh, who, who have uh, one solid foot in the world of social policy and social work and another solid foot in, the, in, in just, you know, figuring out how to do it right in these mm -hmm. health services research areas where there's a lot of ways to do it wrong. So you have to really pay attention to, and, and, you know, a lot of junk research gets published. So really trying to figure out a way to do, you know, to, do, to, to, to make sure that what you're doing is, is valid. And, and, and that is what helps to uh, move forward the use of these data because people literally haven't developed and validated the measures in many cases and, and, and uh, uh, trying to use these, these kind of things in valid ways. You know, what are, valid measures of disparities. Right. You know, the federal government has worked on this for years. They've had these national goals. The metrics aren't very good. They need to be improved and they need to be built into the health system so we can start right. having accountability. Yeah, that's a very, that's a really important point. I think part of uh, one of our goals and I think probably your, your, your team's goals as well is sharing with everyone else the you know the output that you have especially you know with regards to utilizing data and metrics in these uh, really complex social medical um, questions of our time so um i'd like to know and i'd like to know from each of you really um what 
you know, means of dissemination are you planning to utilize towards the end of the grant cycle, but even beyond that, you know, one of the things that I'm very concerned about with regards to um, this type of work, particularly getting it out to the communities um, from which this data is generated is the fact that a lot of it is behind paywalls. You know, in, in academia, that's how you get ahead, right? You publish in the right journals, but people in the, the regular world don't have access to those journals and therefore have to wait even longer for, to, to find out what works because it's, you know, the pages of whatever journal it might be. So what have you been thinking of? And I know that you put this in your grant, so you can talk about this as well. Um, what have you been thinking of doing to try to get this message out, this idea that we you know, really need to use data for good? So we, we, we love doing that. And it, it is, a, uh, it is a, 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 a long process of building partnerships with communities. So in, in the last couple of years, um, we have really started to engage um, the organizations in, in New Jersey who work closely with consumers. We have a partnership um, with a, a, a group called NCARBH, which is a phenomenal group that works with all of the um, uh, <clears throat> patient oriented with uh, the patient community for, uh, for mental health and behavioral health and works closely with the, the provider community. And, uh, um, and, and we've, we've started developing partnerships with organizations like the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice. Mm -hmm. And we've really worked on trying to have, have this uh, targeted dissemination strategy that doesn't just rely on the peer reviewed publication. Uh, some, of the, some of the areas that we've had the most impact uh, is, is really by developing these networks where sort of people who are involved in decisions, whether they're in state agencies, they're, whether they're in federal agencies, mm -hmm. uh, get access to these data as they're being generated. I mean, we had, for example, a wonderful uh, conversation yesterday with uh, one of our colleagues who's, who's now in the HHS secretary's office and working on their, their overdose prevention plan. Um, we try to invest in uh, creating webinars that are available uh, to people at multiple levels and to publicize those so that, uh, uh, that, 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 that people in communities, so people in, in uh, local government, people in all kinds of other roles um, have access uh, to, to, to this information. We've used policy briefs that are publicly uh, publicly available. We just did one that's uh, that, that that's on our website on uh, uh, the outcomes of uh, uh, some some uh, decarceration initiatives in New Jersey, where uh, we had during early in the, the pandemic in in the in the New Jersey prisons prisoners. Uh, we we had a lot of spread of COVID, right. and uh, uh, the 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 state took action and uh, passed legislation to have uh, early releases for large numbers of people. So on November 4th, uh, 2020, uh, more than 2000 people were released on one day. And there was uh, uh, Department of Corrections and many others were concerned, what's the capacity of our reentry support systems to handle that? So, so we did a combination of things, uh, interviews, uh, with people who were released, interviews with the reentry providers. And we got a very good reception uh, to this issue brief from the Department of Correction. And, and these are the kind of ways that we try to translate these kinds of results into, uh, into things that will really uh, sort of, sort of um, uh, impact changes. We work with the uh, uh, the New Jersey Medicaid program and the New Jersey uh, Division of Mental Health and, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Addiction Services to uh, try to feedback information to them on the effectiveness of some of their interventions, like the, uh, they have something called the Office-Based Addiction Treatment Program, which is trying to increase uh, access to substance use treatment in primary care. Mm -hmm. So we've been feeding information back to them 
the Four Foundation has been a great partner in helping us to do these, these national webinars. So um, within the limits of the resources that we have, and we're always juggling resources to do this because these things take a lot of preparation. Right. But, uh, uh, but we really try to invest in these, these partnerships with uh, the organizations, uh, whether they're policymakers or, 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 or state agencies or uh, patient advocacy organizations mm -hmm. that can, can really bring this information you know, and, and, and say, and it's, it's been so interesting in the, in the COVID period because things have been moving fast. Right. Uh, so we addressed, we tried to address these issues like uh, um, the telehealth flexibilities how well were they implemented? And we're trying to get a handle with, with our state partners on uh, what was the impact of, of, of that, uh, of those changes on, on, on equity. So we, we really try hard to use multiple uh, sources of dissemination. So I'm looking at the time and I, you know, we've had a really fantastic conversation and these will continue over the coming months. But I just wanted to know from each of you, do you have any final thoughts um, about health inequity, about social justice, the intersection between those and other social issues, whatever you would like to share with the audience, um, you can definitely work in the, um, you know, increasing importance about data and social work. Um, whatever you'd like to say, just a couple minutes about how this work is going to, to, to impact what you do going forward, whether it's with regards to dissemination, your research, a little of everything. And this is something that I'm going to kind of chop off for each of you. So I just want to be sure that we have something, you know, distinct for each of, you know, each person. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll dive in, 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 in first, and uh, uh, I'm sure that J Jennifer will have some of those important thoughts as well. So uh, as I think about what we're trying to do right now and, and, and the, the effort to work with real-time data that is capturing this entire extraordinary pandemic period, I come back to the idea that you did in, 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 in your wonderful uh, interview with uh, Mark, Mark Freeman, which is that we don't wanna go back to the pre-pandemic business as usual, and we can't go back. What we've, what we've had is the most extraordinary period of experiments with doing things differently. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when we think, when we think about the equity issues in healthcare, uh, which are fundamental, uh, uh, and, and, and structurally driven. We've learned, we're learning more about what those structural factors are and, and, and just the obstacles in people being able to access healthcare. So how do we do, reduce those, those obstacles? And when you look, for example, at the transformation of the behavioral health care system, uh, uh, people often don't realize how huge that was that we, 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 we had an increase in, in the use of telehealth, in behavioral health. That was the area where the, the uptake was greatest. And, and that increase was on the order of 2,000%, 3,000% in some of our major payers like Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and so that is potentially transformative for people that uh, uh, people who are living with uh, social challenges, limited resources, transportation challenges, mm -hmm. family caregiving responsibility challenges, just this old fashioned model of you have to get yourself physically into the office at the right time. We used to have no show rates in, in our big systems like the New York Health and Hospitals Corporation of in the order of 30% before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those pretty much disappeared. So how do we, uh, uh, but not everybody benefited from those changes. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a smartphone, you have to have minutes, you have to uh, have a private place to do it. So I think this is some of the, throughout healthcare, but especially in behavioral health, uh, what have we learned from this extraordinary period and how can we 
inserted into the system? How do we identify the remaining barriers to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to people who can't negotiate healthcare as kind of an adversary system? Uh, and, and, and how do we use the data to inform us of, of uh, um, how these, these uh, what is the impact of these huge changes? So I think that's the one thing that is just gonna tell us the most about what we need to do in the future. Jennifer? Yeah, um, you know, what I've noticed, I guess, in the last year and a half is that these sorts of conversations are happening much more frequently. And that's hopeful to me um, because you're getting, you're bringing in more people from lots of different disciplines who maybe haven't been focused on these issues before, but have the expertise or resources that are needed to unpack them and understand them. Um, but, you know, like Steve was saying, while we have these natural experiments happening where we're trying to make it easier for people, especially with behavioral health conditions, to gain access to care, we are still seeing, you know, sort of as you keep peeling the onion back, we're seeing, okay, well now we're uncovering more inequity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, you know, a feeling that we kind of have a handle on kind of what the scope is and now we need to just figure out policy interventions. But I really don't think we even have the full scope of how deeply um, these inequities run and for whom. Right. So, while I'm very hopeful because we are having more conversation, there is a focus on this work. Um, what I'm hoping will happen is that then that translates into funders and folks who can provide those resources like you're doing with P-Tech with this phenomenal data access um, to really kind of come to the table as well because it's, it's not enough to just talk about it. Uh, we need to have those resources uh, and, and the right people involved to be able to really uh, look at these questions and, and continue uh, peeling back that onion to better understand both the problem and then also, of course, identifying and testing solutions for them. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you both for joining me today, Dr. Stephen Crystal and Dr. Jennifer Miles from the Rutgers University School of Social Work. They are uh, recipients of our first uh, health inequity research grant. They'll be working with IQVIA, uh, with one of our data partners, and looking forward to really excellent outcomes from your work. No pressure. But it sounds like you guys really have the, the, the knowledge and the expertise to do exactly what we're looking for. Um, so with that, I would again like to thank you both for joining us. And we will be updating people throughout the course of the year on what our grantees are doing. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Bye.